Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Dan Columbus, a research scientist at Prairie Swine Center. So Dan, you've been on the show a few times now, but before we get started, would you mind reminding the audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll give the, the quick version this time. If they want the longer version, they can go to another podcast. Uh, like you said, I'm a research scientist at Prairie Swine. I've been here since about 2015. Uh, and I'm also adjunct at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, before that, I did uh, my graduate school training in uh, the University of Guelph with Dr. Case DeLang, and that was all with minerals and proteins, and then moved down to Texas for a postdoc with Dr. Teresa Davis looking at low birth weight pigs, and then came up here, and I've been here ever since. So, Gotcha. So you sent me some studies on the long-term effects of feeding high levels of deoxynevalanol, Dawn, Vomitoxin, or whatever you want to call it, to pigs in the grow finish period. So how large of an effect does Vomitoxin have on pigs, and at what levels should we be concerned? Yeah, so if you look at the literature, you know, Dawn is one of those ones, it's it's kind of all over, and there's a big focus of it, and the result, uh, the, the impacts that you get are going to be very dependent on who you read. Right. And it's everything from, you know, a little, little bit of a drop in performance um, to, to anything from, you know, vomiting and immune problems and gut problems and everything, depending on where you put there, even though it's it's a little bit uh, variable. You, sometimes you get really negative responses at low levels and, and nothing at, at higher levels. Right. So we um, knowing this, you know, we specifically then wanted to look at dawn in grow finish pigs and for a number of reasons one is that a lot of the studies are done in younger pigs uh so nursery specifically uh to look at the negative effects and not a lot in the grow finish um and the other reason is is we wanted to look at you know what happens if you you feed them there is some indication that pigs will adapt if you if they're allowed to eat this for for uh, a, a length of a length of time and i think you know, if we want to improve the sustainability of, of pork production or livestock production in general, we need to be able to incorporate things like mycotoxin infected grains that, you know, can't be used for humans. So we we, we did two studies. Um, one was a, a finisher study, so starting at about 75 kilograms of body weight. And the other one we started in the grower uh, at about 35 kilos. Uh, and we brought both of those studies up to market. We fed the pigs either... Uh, a control diet or a diet containing uh, uh, Dawn contaminated wheat to provide one, three or five ppm of Dawn. And they ate that like throughout the entire study, right? So we never, there wasn't, we didn't feed it for a short time and take it off. We continued to feed them uh, to see what would happen. And, you know, it, it, in, in the finisher pigs, you get a very drastic and immediate response in uh, so a drop in feed intake, which obviously is going to affect performance. And in the grower pigs, we saw kind of it wasn't as drastic and wasn't as immediate and kind of variable. Um, and overall, like I said, we, you know, we have that drop in performance, which obviously drops uh, market weight at the end. Uh, but after about three or four weeks in both the studies, the pigs recovered. And so feed intake and performance went right back up to where you would expect um, in a non-contaminated diet. And that was dependent, the time was dependent on how much uh, John they were getting. The interesting part of this and, and what we really wanted to look at too was, you know, knowing that there could be those effects on health, you know, what, what did we see? And we saw very little or no effect at all on any measures of liver or kidney health, overall health, nutrient utilization, or feed efficiency, right? So all those reports kind of showing that, you know, you can't feed it, you're going to have all these problems we didn't see. Uh, and the majority of the negative response seemed to be feed intake. So as long as you can get that back up, you know, then you'll be fine. Or if you wait it out, they'll, they'll adapt and recover on their own. So, Gotcha. So from an economic perspective, let's say you have to use Dawn, it's what's available, Dawn corn or Dawn wheat, whatever it is, and that's the only thing you have available. From an economic perspective, what can a producer expect when feeding um, these certain levels of Dawn in terms of loss and gain? Yeah, so when we were looking at body weight, I think, um, and we marketed them all on the same day, regardless. So we didn't wait. So if you, if you, if you do it by time, I think you got anywhere from a 
three to eight kilo difference in that market weight, depending on whether you're giving three or five ppm. Uh, I should say that with one ppm, we didn't see anything, right? There's no effect of feeding one ppm at all. Um, so you do have that, you know, they they don't work, they recover for performance, but they don't recover that body weight, right? So you either have to market them lighter or keep them longer to get them up to what your market weight was. And we also wanted to look at um, the economics from, you know, if you're going to use these feeds or what, uh, what would your losses be from an economic standpoint or how much cheaper would you have to get those things to, to, to make it work. And I, and I apologize because the, the economics are do not incorporate the high feed costs that we're seeing right now. This is done quite a few years ago, but just to give the, the listeners an idea, you know, um, with three to five PPM Dawn, you're looking at anywhere from a two to seven uh, dollar marginal feed cost reduction uh, in your pigs, which then ended up resulting in if you just looked at um, the diet cost savings that you would need, you'd have to have, uh, you know, about maybe a seventy dollar savings per ton if you wanted to, um, in order to incorporate this on an ingredient basis, that was quite a bit different, you know, to where you'd have to um, anywhere, maybe like $150 less a ton for your ingredient, depending if you're going on something that was going to result in a 5 ppm diet that you were getting. And that was specifically with wheat that we looked at for that one. Gotcha. So another question I had is, how frequently do you think we need to test for mycotoxins? Because when we're talking about the grow finish pe- period, they're going through grain really fast. And you can't really test every batch of corn that comes in or every batch of wheat or what have you for certain dawn levels. So what do you think is the best um, method in terms of regular testing and evaluating the mycotoxins or specifically the dawn levels in your grains? Yeah, I, I think testing is one of those kind of uh, can of worms when it comes to mycotoxins, right? Because obviously ideal would be every load that comes in, you want to test, but then it becomes a question of how do you test? And I think that's more important when it comes to mycotoxins. You want like a number of samples throughout the entire batch to make sure it's representative. And even then it might not be. And we see that, you know, when we're testing the diets for these studies and everything. So um Actually, one of the things that we did in this study as well is we took blood and urine samples from those pigs to see how much uh, the dawn in those samples correlated to the intake. And and they correlate very well. Uh, So that is something that, you know, could be considered that if you think you have a problem and you can't seem to find it in the feed or your ingredient, right, that you might potentially consider taking, you know, a biological sample from the pig and seeing, okay, am I picking up Dawn in the blood? So yes, they are uh, eating it, right? Awesome. So the last question I have for you, Dan, is what are your next steps for you guys up there? What are you planning to do? Are you planning to do more mycotoxin research? Or are you trying to go down a different line of research? And so one of the things that we're really interested in looking at, just because with this study, we, we kind of showed that the majority of that negative impact is due to a reduction in feed intake, is we want to see if you adjust the nutrient content of the diet, can you, you know, negate that effect or mitigate that effect somewhat, right? So you account for the fact that they're eating 15% less feed and, and what that impact is. So that's kind of what we're thinking about right now and, and where we're hoping to go. Anamin International Supplier of Precision Minerals. When most trace minerals are only bioavailable, Anamin trace elements are also active in the digestive tract and permit secure piglets' gut health. Gotcha. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, Dan, and sharing all this research with us. Yeah, thanks. Always good to be back. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Oh.